how do we design AI in a more responsible way so it supports the well-being of the population? I mean, that should be the purpose of all technologies. What's the point of a technology that makes people feel worse or doesn't help them feel better? That is nonsensical, but it often happens. Welcome to the Mind Tech Podcast, where we dive deep into the unsolved problems in mental health with the people building technology to solve them, including founders, investors, and experts in technology for the mind. I'm Manu, your host, and today's guest is Professor Rafael Calvo, a pioneer in the well-being technology space as the director of the Wellbeing Technologies Lab at the Dyson School of Design Engineering, many projects of which I'm excited for you to learn about in this episode. Professor Calvo is also Imperial College London's co-lead for the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence, which sounds incredibly cool, and I can assure you that the work they do is just as cool, especially in exploring the impact of artificial intelligence. When I was a young medical student, I first came across Professor Calvo after googling mental health technology research at Imperial College London, where I was studying at the time. I then saw that he had written a book called Positive Computing, which is all about technology for well-being and fulfilling human potential. Another very cool sounding title. I read the book and it was genuinely life-changing as it introduced to me the key research and developments at the intersection of well-being and computing. Professor Calvo and I then met up and since then I've been advising his masters and PhD students on mental health innovations that they're creating. This has been a real joy for me, and today you as well will get to peek under the hood of the Wellbeing Technologies Lab and learn how we can build digital environments that support our basic psychological needs. Professor Calvo also shares why he has chosen to make his contribution to mental health technology as a professor rather than as an entrepreneur, and he outlines his views on the problems in mental health that haven't yet been solved, indicating where the opportunities for innovation lie. Let's get into it. It's a, a true honor to have you here, of course, at Imperial, where I studied. I reached out to you with the intention of developing my career towards mental health technology as you were and still are a real leader in that domain. And it's wonderful to continue working with you since then. But for our audience today, it will be great to uh, run through a few things that have led you here, really leading up to, to why you've chosen this field. You started your academic career studying physics and then completed a PhD in neural networks. Given your background as a software engineer, wh why did you choose to dedicate your life's work towards well-being and human potential? So it's funny. So I did my degree in physics uh, back in Argentina. No? This was in the 80s, mid 80s. And in the, uh, the university, I would say more generally all over Argentina, psychology, meant choosing between Freudian, Lacan, it was all psychoanalysts. So I was very interested in psychology, but I wasn't particularly interested in that very narrow perspective on it. Uh, and then when I started physics, I did physics and philosophy. At least for the first year in Argentina, I could do the two degrees. Then I just stuck to physics. So it was hard enough for me. So. But within physics, I look for topics that are related to psychology. So back then, in the 80s, was uh, the start of neural networks. Uh, so I work on, it's related to cognitive science. Uh, so the first people doing neural networks were not exactly computer scientists, they were uh, cognitive scientists. So a lot of the initial work already when I was doing physics was very closely related to psychology. Then, at the beginning, at the turn of the century, around 2000, I, I will say, I started getting into, uh, so I work on AI, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning methods, from the 80s to 2000, roughly. And then, uh, in 2000, I started working on effective computing, that is when you build systems to recognize human emotions, uh, and in a way, uh, a lot of my early career was built around that reputation, etc. What is obvious, but it takes a while to act 
accept completely is that well-being doesn't come out just out of emotions. No. So the idea of building these affected computer systems for myself and for many of my colleagues was that we could build interactions with the computer and also with other humans that supported positive emotions. But well-being doesn't come out of positive emotions. It's not a lot more than that, right? Uh, so I started working with psychologists and um, psychiatrists. In, uh, this was back at the University of Sydney. Uh, I was there for 18 years, between 2000 and 2019. And so that's when we started working on interventions uh, for mental health. And the first project was funded by the Movember Foundation. And uh, that was a, a really big one and with a lovely team, really fantastic team of it. So that was a long <laughs> story on how to go I got to work in it, in mental health technologies. So. Of course, the rise of technology during your working life presented with it some opportunities for you to apply those philosophical interests, right? With so many technologies being optimized for productivity and accuracy and efficiency. And you saw that there was not enough focus on well-being and that well-being should be really at the top of the principles underpinning these technologies, which of course led to you developing uh, the Positive Computing Lab at Sydney, which was then moved to Imperial. Would you be able to give some insight into the decision to start that and where that's taking you. Yes, um, the motto of the lab and all all the projects we work on follow that is that all technologies should be designed to support well-being. Why did you choose to make your contribution to this mission as a professor rather than say as an entrepreneur? Hmm. So that's a good question. I guess that a lot of it is connected to what eventually became my psychological framework to use in, in designing for well-being, and it, that I have a very high demand for autonomy. So an autonomy, it's about building a team that has a goal that is not necessarily driven by economic uh, needs, requirements. It allows you 100% freedom to say whatever you want, work on whatever topic you want. And the only place you can do that is at university. I, I think that's... Uh, so entrepreneurs, especially when they get into a stage of being a bit more successful, are generally very restricted because they have to answer to the investors. Uh, they have to have very short timelines. They sometimes don't have enough time to go in depth into the problems uh, and so forth. As an academic, it's not like academic life is is perfect in that sense. It's a lot more similar to the company than uh, people outside academia, academia tend to understand. Uh, but yes, we have a lot more of freedom to do whatever we would want. There are obviously needs within the university. We do have to spend, uh, and I enjoy it enormously, teaching. We, we have to split our time into different uh, roles. But in, my, in, in that role, I feel my autonomy supported like in nowhere else is possible. Mm, so the freedom and decision-making power to work on a variety of projects and also nurture young, ambitious, hardworking minds to uh, take on these projects and lead them themselves. Because of course, if you help someone develop their own ideas and they then go off and build those as, a, as an entrepreneur, then um, by proxy, you are having impact there as well, whilst also being able to plant other seeds and uh, work on other things yourself. So. It's just a, a fascinating option for people wanting to make an impact in this way to really consider academia, especially somewhere as innovative as the Dyson School of Design Engineering, as a very viable option for that. Yeah, and you actually bring the second 
psychological need that we work around. Uh, so the first one was human autonomy. No, uh, I have maybe a particularly high need on that. But we all have needs also for relatedness and sense of competence. And the community, the academic community, uh, just provides a really nice support. I think that one doesn't necessarily make a difference for me with the startups. I had very good friends in the startups. Uh, I work with startups right now and build fantastic relationships. So that could have happened in both places. But in academia, um, yeah, I have supervised 23 PhD students and I keep in touch with them and they're just wonderful people. Half of them maybe have stayed in academia, half of them have gone to, uh, you know, direct companies or start their own or all things like that. And yeah, that's a wonderful experience. Also, all the postdocs that come through the lab or move on to do fantastic work all over the world. And that's mm. a really nice uh, feeling. And all my work is only possible because I have them, right? No, I couldn't do anything yep. without PhD students and postdocs that come through the lab. And building that sense of community is really nice. Dyson, it's also, I moved from Sydney in 2019, and that's Dyson School of Design Engineering. It's an amazing place to work in. It's like so enjoyable. It's the most interdisciplinary school that I can think of. I've never uh, worked or been at an institution or a school that is a mini-me of the whole institution, of the whole school. Now we have, uh, right now we have about 30 academic staff. Um, we have psychologists. We have three psychologists. One that did psychology, but first did comparative literature. Then we have people that are hardcore engineers. Um, we have people that are do three people that do robotics, three people that do uh, batteries. We have people that do control theory and mathematics. Uh, and then the outcomes of the students. The students are just amazing. Uh, so the community there is wonderful. Well, well you you have had experience. Uh, spending time mm. and helping many of these students, to which I'm always very grateful, because if the projects go cover just so many topics. No? Uh, in undergraduate, we have projects um, that you have helped co-supervise, uh, projects on things that go from building leather, um, what they call it, vegan leather couches. So how to rethink the furniture industry. To, to mm. be more sustainable, to, for example, developing AI systems for people working in, in Peru. No, I had one of my students work in this other project on Dementia in Peru and do uh, ethnographic work together with, uh, in those rural areas in Peru. So the topics are just like completely uh, very, very widespread. Now, of course, there are many things mm. in common. No? It's about the methods of design the methods of engineering, they, they are really strong on the engineering fundamentals, but they have this ability of being very, very creative. So working there and that community is just so wonderful to work in. Mm, they all have very strong ethical principles behind them, trying to take on a, an unmet need. And of course, that is one of the most fundamental aspects of impactful innovation for it to be need led. In your books, your research and your talks, you often orientate the design of technology around those three basic human needs that you mentioned, autonomy, uh, a willingness to take action that aligns with someone's goals and values, competence, of course, something that is challenging enough to get the best out of someone, but not so challenging that they feel belittled and relatedness, that sense of social connection, feeling understood and that sense of belonging. Of course, this these three basic human needs were developed by Desi and Ryan in their self-determination theory. And it's, it's fantastic that these are the starting point when designing technology for well-being, because we, we do need to be need led. So it brings me on to one of the most important questions I'll ask, which is what do you think are some of the deepest needs 
for the mind and particularly the ones that aren't being met? Well, I, I think those three, those three basic psychological needs mm. uh, and the way we support. So our environment, social, family, medical, educational, workplace environments need to support the fulfillment of the psychological needs. So when we are in a school and we have a, a teacher who is shouting at the students and only using carrots and sticks, no, it's not just about mm. the negative effect of um, sticks, but also the negative effects of manipulative extrinsic motivations. In workplaces, if you ever had a micromanager, you would perfectly understand how your need of autonomy that is not being satisfied for that management style ends up in potentially even mental health problems because you will get frustrated, you will get um, you feel small, you feel um, anxious, you feel all these negatives because you have this need to feel empowered and autonomous and, and you can't. So with technology, this is a big deal. Uh, and I think a lot of the problems that we see today in the world is of misinformation, of political divisions, is because people are increasingly growing in, in environments that do not provide them with the autonomy they need. Systems do seem to offer us a lot of options, many more options than we used to have. But those options are manipulative, are options of influence. So everything that you see on the internet is offered to you, and you will say, oh, I have more options. But the way it is offered is driven by an economic prerogative, an economic driver that means that you are being constantly influenced and driven to look at different things and buy different things and spend your time in different things. And it doesn't necessarily come in from within yourself. Now, we don't notice until it's too late uh, when we have 10 hours on TikTok or Instagram, etc. And or when you buy things that you didn't end up needing. So the the economic system and the technology has created this environment where I think often our autonomy is not as well supported as we tend to think. And we think, oh, technology is giving us the possibility of doing all these amazing things. And it's true. That's a wonderful thing about the technological progress that we have had in the last few years. But on the other hand, that same technology, those same options that we are being offered, and not necessarily the options that will come from within, and not the options that we will seek. And that is in a, for, a way of manipulation. And if you're constantly manipulated, I think that has a long-term effect. One current, you were asking me before about ideas that I was thinking that I haven't maybe brought into my, or I'm bringing into, but I haven't published much yet about, is that this situation that I'm describing that is particularly common in the global north, in places like the UK, the US, Australia, etc., have a lot of similarities to what has happened in the global south, societies that have been often colonialized for a long time, where when you are in a situation of colonialism, the people's autonomy, the population's autonomy is being hindered by the environment. There are certain things that you can do, certain things that you cannot. Certain things that, even if you can do the same things that the, the, the colonizing population, you are driven to do different things because you um, there are social pressures, all sorts of different pressures. So you behave in, in ways that are not intrinsic to your well to, to your think, way of thinking. 
And my personal feeling is that, and again, this is not scientific fact. This is uh, um, experiential. The situation that we have suffered in Argentina, Venezuela, many of Latin American countries for decades of going from an authoritarian government to another authoritarian government, so it goes from extreme to extreme, is now happening in other countries, that division. So I've seen parts of my family not talking to each other because you have people that are leaning to, towards the political right or the political left and they don't, they don't, they're not able to, to have a conversation. It could be soccer as well, or many other things. But um, uh, particularly in politics, has become very difficult. And now that's also happening here in the UK, and it's also happening in the US. I, I think the US is in many ways becoming Argentinizing. Right? It's like the the situation, the polarization that we have had for for so long is happening in other countries. And I have an intuition that a lot of that is because when you have an extended period of time where people have not been able to feel empowered or, or have this dissonance between their own values and what they end up doing, um, they end up looking at, uh, at extremes. No? They react in, in things that are puff. Uh, and it's like a headless chicken. It's, hell, it's like a lot of headless chicken running around. And it's literally because people lose something when manipulation affects their life over an extended period of time. They lose an aspect of their decision-making. When you don't have that power of decision-making and the way of the tools, the intrinsic tools to connect and do the things you you feel and obviously, this thing could be different from many different people, right? You and I and other people, we all have a different way of being the pe people we want to be, be the match we want to be. Um, but if the environment is not supporting that individuality, we end up um, dividing, having these uh, reactions. Hmm. What I've gained from that is the role that technology has played in polarizing people and dividing people. Of course, we, many of us learned about it when watching that Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, and how people, politicians, manipulated us by harnessing the power of technology to polarize us. And it's interesting how this comes to mind when talking about well-being rather than something like the the presence or absence of depression or anxiety because these are thought to be you know, clinical mental disorders but really what you're talking about elevates it beyond just a clinical definition and more to a very humanistic um, way that humans are civilized and how we we treat each other so in terms of the landscape that this has created the current state of the world and the emerging state of AI, what do you think are the opportunities here? What do you think are the gaps in mental health technology? And how do you envision emerging technologies being able to serve these gaps? Well, as you know, and the audience in the podcast know, there are tons of apps and new interventions being designed, and they will get better on the time. Increasingly, uh, what many of these interventions are trying to do is to use AI. You know? For example, having better conversational agents. It is true. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of research on diagnosis uh, for the last 10, 15 years, where you can use AI to better sense when a person needs mental health support. So that I'm, I'm, I have been often skeptical about the benefits because we know, for example, in the UK, there is tons more of people that need support than the NHS can help. In fact, when you go um, to a doctor, and so you end up, or people who can afford it try to go to a private doctor, private service, and if the person that you're trying to help uh, is talking about suicide ideation. 
the most serious forms of mental health support needed. The private sector cannot support it. And, and there are so many ways in which uh, people fall through the cracks uh, in the NHS services. So because there could be issues of substance abuse. Uh, mental health are very, very complex problems. NHS resources just cannot stretch that much. So diagnosis, it's useful. But on the other hand, if you can't provide the support they need, what's the point of doing even more diagnosis, right? Um, and when you have one quarter of the population always having mental health issues, at any point in time having a mental health issue, you, you need to scale in a completely different way. And that's where a, a lot of the innovation has come up in, in providing support to a large segment of the population. So what we call the active well-being interventions. So that will be things like the apps I mentioned. Um, I, I have collaborated or helped uh, companies like Metal. It's uh, uh, producing mental health technologies for males, Haven VR, who is doing mindfulness interventions with VR, virtual reality. But maybe the problem of these interventions is that they don't generally look at the everyday life. I think that's where we will have the most impact. And a lot of my work is, is looking at how the environments that we're creating with artificial intelligence can be done more responsibly. So they don't have the negative effects that I mentioned before. So when you build a platform like Microsoft Teams or Google Office or that sort of thing, they're created in a way that support well-being. Now, if you're creating the technologies for a workplace, you do it in a way that employees feel supported, that they are not, uh, their psychological needs are supported, basically. Um, and, and this is a particularly big issue for AI. So how do we design AI in a more responsible way so it supports the well-being of the population? I mean, that should be the purpose of all technologies. What's the point of a technology that makes people feel worse no? or doesn't help them feel better? That is nonsensical, but it often happens. So uh, my interest also is a lot around those things. So we have to improve the environment. Sometimes, obviously, it's not just environmental. There are other reasons why people have mental health problems. Um, and in those cases, we need to provide better support. When you say these everyday sort of needs, everyday unmet needs, what specific ones are you referring to? Well, uh, recently we worked with a technology company uh, in helping them improve their design processes. Uh, so they would create products uh, that at better supporting the well-being of the users. Uh, we have done this now, we are starting a, a third project with a third technology company. And in each of these cases, they have design teams, product teams. And product teams, generally you will have designers and engineers, and business people coming together and creating and doing their innovation work. But well-being is not generally a parameter that they work on in these teams. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to create a new mobile phone. And when, when people do that, they say, oh, but okay, how do we do to improve the well-being of the users? They look more at, at functional aspects, or how do I make a better phone call, or the sound is better. But improving the, the, the quality of the microphone is not directly going to be connected to the, the, the way our psychological well-being. But maybe there are other things that do, no? that are more about how we embody communication through the mobile phone so we can have a, a better quality human-to-human -human communication. How, do I, how can I feel more connected to Manu or to the audience that Manu 
is connecting to that this podcast goes to when I create a platform like the phone, the camera, the, this new software that you're using to record the podcast, how can it be done in a way that I can communicate better and people in the audience can understand myself better? That, and understanding is not just about the dialogue, right? About the voice, the language. It's a lot more than that. Are there other way, expressions that we could mm. use? I mean, people are looking at VR. They're looking at completely different new approaches to improving communication. Well, looking at what would be the impact of, of well-being on well-being of that. No, like for example, when we mm. do VR, when you have uh, kind of an avatar, so can can you create an avatar that improves? The connection with you, with the human. You're not an electronic representation. Mm. You are an actual human. That in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know. I'm proud to know. But uh, in in many cases, I have worked for a long period of time with people that I have only met on Teams. Right. So how can the mm. team support that human connection better? So what you're saying is, instead of focusing on creating an app that is going to improve everyone's well-being what we should do is think about how we can incorporate elements to improve well-being in everything that we use every technology every environment that we're in if we can have this underpinning promotion of well-being permeate everything we do then that is going to have a much greater impact a much more ubiquitous impact in improving well-being than just focusing all our attention on one Hail Mary uh, app or technology, for example, which really does serve as the uh, crux of the Wellbeing Technologies Lab that you are the director of, of course, because instead of just focusing on one solution, you think of bringing this attitude, this, uh, these values towards every technology. Would you say that's an accurate representation? Totally, totally. We work with companies who need or are aware of their need to improve their design processes. So as design researchers, design engineer researchers, uh, we can provide the best evidence on how to support well-being in, in their product-making process. Um, mm. And I think that's really important for, for industry, no? And over time, I think what matters most is not the papers, academic scholarly work we do that's really important because in the long term that's what maybe will remain over time where people will not necessarily remember the contribution we made to a particular product that might not be there five years down the road but i think the the impact the real impact we can have is in helping industry improve their processes so well-being becomes a standard practice look at usability now, every single designer out there will consider the usability of a product, right? And they do yeah. usability testing, and we have very well-known methods for that, and we have created tools like eye tracking and tons of other different things to help usability experts improve the usability of a product. That means reducing the time it takes to accomplish a task with a particular product. Well-being is not even close to that. And come on, being the, if you compare the benefits of usability and the benefits of well-being, to me, mm. it's obvious which one is tons more important. Or well-being is much more important. And there are methods that we can use to improve the way the technology supports well-being. And that should be the focus of companies. And we are increasingly working with regulators trying to help policymakers make decisions about, like, how to create the social environments that, that lean towards this. So. so just as much as product teams should consider usability, they should also consider well-being. And if that's the outcome of all the work you do, then that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, you also mentioned earlier in this discussion uh, something that relates to a... A statement that you told me once before, which which has always stayed with me, which is mental health has more of a treatment problem than it does a diagnosis problem. And it's interesting 
to hear that from you because uh, of your work in effective computing, which exists to recognize and interpret and even generate emotions of its own when interacting with humans, which is all fantastic in understanding someone's mental state. But how do we bridge that gap? What, what are the next steps in closing that gap between effective diagnosis and effective treatment through technology? Well, I, I do not engage in any mental health problem that has no mental health aid to it. Uh, and I think this is or needs to be a, uh, a thing in every research project, in any startup. Any startup I work, I kind of require the same thing. And it's because the technology can only help in the treatment. It's not going to do the treatment. I still think we can automate uh, big chunks of the process, the therapeutic process, um, but there has to be a lot of human intervention. I, I, I still think that's quite important. And I realize that that might be controversial with many of my colleagues, both in the technology and also in the psychiatry area. But I still think it's very important that therapy ceases as a uh, meets of the two. Of course, there is a space for technology companies that are building technology products where human therapies don't appear. But this is not for cases of mental illness where people have been diagnosed. It is for people who are just not doing well. They're going through a tough time. When you have clinical depression, you need a human clinical therapy uh, who might use technologies and will benefit from technologies. But one has to make that distinction, right? Uh, because otherwise, what happens is that the human clinical team, organization, service provider like the NHS might relinquish their obligations to provide the support that the people need and that's not because sometimes people talk about empowering the patient that's not empowering the patient that's relinquishing the right to proper medical care uh, and one has to always keep that distinction in, in mm -hmm. philosophy they talk about positive rights and versus negative rights the right to be left alone versus the right to be provided with the services that help you become the maximum you could be. Well, another fantastic philosophical value that should underpin even the most computer-based uh, topics in, in technology. So um, the multidisciplinary benefit there is, is huge. Uh, just a, a couple of things before we bring this to a close. I very much appreciate you explaining how it's you know uh, it's the job of the technology designers to create the conditions for people to live autonomously competently and in a way that relates to others not telling them what to do but giving the con them conditions to be able to live by these values and in particular in your book positive computing you and, and dorian write about the importance of designing well-being in schools to help children develop the psychological resources they need for a healthy experience through life. So my question to you is, what do you think is the best way to give children the conditions out of which well-being can emerge? So before I started working on effective computing between, let's say, 2000 or the late 90s and 2000, I worked a lot on learning technologies. And back then, people will say, oh, with all these learning technologies, we're going to help students learn more, be better, etc. But what I started noticing is that in some places, uh, particularly in some states in the US, the United States, the educational system was replacing human teachers for big classrooms, especially in the poor school. If you're poor, they will have, in a poor school, they will often have a huge computer lab uh, and they will have very few teachers. I remember reading a, an interesting survey article 
uh, about this uh, the Boston articles in the New York Times etc and that that wasn't right I, it's just I wasn't working on building better learning technologies to replace teachers in under resourced places because in some places it, it is about replacing it's, it's easier if it becomes easier the policy maker just says oh let's just put more computers we don't need more the same happens in mental health and well, but going back to your question, to improve the learning environments, we need teachers that are well resources and can provide the support that the kids need and the caring that the kids need, um, the human connection, that have the time to and the autonomy to be able to provide and yeah, what the kids need. Now, the kids need a lot of human connection. Um, and, and they already have plenty of technology. They don't need us to be showing them much more about technology um, that they already have. Uh, I mean, the computational mind, in, in many cases, is useful, but computational mind has nothing to do with computers. Hmm. So it's it's more about a scientific mind. It's a mind that looks at nature and it's curious about nature and so forth so having i think one of the most important things in school is just providing the resources so humans can talk to humans and learn and develop as social entities i guess then the real benefit the most impactful thing you can do is just reframe it as is everything we're doing giving children the conditions to live by these values of autonomy, competence, and relatedness? Are we giving them the conditions for well-being, whether that be through our human human interactions or any computer-human interactions that we facilitate with the use of technology? So viewing everything through that lens is the real unlock here. My last question to you, which I'm sure there will be many things to choose from because of how many different wonderful projects you are a part of is what are you working on right now that excites you the most? Oh, that's a difficult question because it's kind of like asking <laughs> which is your favorite child, right? And we don't have a favorite child. Hmm. Um, but the one that is taking a lot of my time, energy, thinking is this project in Peru. I'm really excited about that. I'm uh, being able to help uh, communities that have often been forgotten. Uh, we have a community in the Amazon, in Iquitos, one in Huancayo, in the Andes, in, on the coast, Tumbes, uh, Lima. Uh, and I'm in charge of the design and engineering of the, the platform that will be used. Uh, and we're going to be tracking over a couple of years 32,000 older adults who have no medical care generally. Uh, who have everything from linguistic problems because they they speak in Quechua, the the indigenous one of the many indigenous languages in Peru, uh, and the doctors speak in Spanish. So there are all these different issues, and we're trying to get into a very complex problem where we hope to have a very positive impact. So that's one that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I'm also working with an amazing team on a proposal for uh, better informing the design of algorithmic influencing systems. So these are where you use AI for uh, changing people's choices on, on decision making. So influencing, but when you use AI for influencing. So how can we design and regulate these things better so they have a positive impact on well-being rather than negative? So I think those are two of my, those are the two that are taking a lot of my energy lately. Hmm. How do you divide your time between contributing to these these projects, doing some of the development work um, versus your time teaching versus maybe your time researching or, or what, what, what else fills your time? Because it seems like you you do have autonomy to choose how much you want to give to each one 
I just wonder, and I think the audience might be wondering for someone in your position as a professor in the design of well-being technologies, how is your time divided between these things? Uh, that's a very long story, but for those academics out there, generally, in many of the universities I work, generally it's 40-40-20. 40% 40 20. 40 mm -hmm. of your time is two days a week is teaching, two days a week is uh, research, and one day is administration. Uh, administration sometimes includes uh, the services we provide to uh, our academic community. Like I spend a lot of time reviewing grants and papers that other people submit. So peer reviewing is such an important aspect of our uh, community. Uh, and then teaching. Um, I love teaching. I love my students. Uh, but that takes at least two days a week. Um, that is where the least flexibility, where we have the least flexibility, hmm. because you need to timetable large classes and issues like that, right? So, and and then I have the I try to have the, my two full days of research a week, or at least parts that add up to roughly two days a week where I do the project that we have been talking about. Amazing. Rapa, it's been a pleasure to discuss your journey and the exciting work that you and your team are doing at the Wellbeing Technologies Lab in Dyson, at the uh, Future Intelligence um, uh, you know, Department and um, all of the research journals you're a part of. Um, for everyone listening, how can people support and follow your work? Now I have moved out mostly from Twitter. I hardly ever use ads of Twitter. Uh, but you can go and find myself and the school, the Dyson School of Design Engineering on LinkedIn. And that's for social media. And you can also contact me on, on that platform. Um, yeah, I think that will be the best um, for supporting. Well, just contact and let, let's see. How, yeah. Hmm. I, I also know that there's a, the positivecomputing.org website, which uh, yeah. offers a toolkit on well-being supportive design with checklists and cheat sheets and workshop plans and access to the books and resources. So that would be a wonderful place as well. I'd highly recommend going there. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> that shows that I'm not the best at marketing, but yes, we have <laughs> uh, the website and all the resources that we develop and um, papers, etc. open access. Uh, so companies uh, can use that. Um, we use those when we work with companies. So, yes, you can find all of that in the website. Thank you. All, all to build digital environments that make us happier and healthier, not just more productive. Excellent. So, Rafa, thank you very much for your time. I've had a great experience uh, learning more about your work and exploring some really important issues with you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining today. Thank you, Manu. Thank you so much for inviting me. If you have an interesting take on anything we discussed, feel free to share your two cents in the comments. And if you're feeling kind, then leave a review, which would be hugely appreciated. If you're interested in learning a little more about your mind and how you can get the most from your most powerful resource, you can check out The Mind Explored, an email newsletter I send each week with an insight into your mind and a tool to make it healthier. All you need is in the description. Thank you for your interest in the mind and how technology can meet its needs. Until next time, goodbye.